I'm so happy to be here at Cambridge. I grew up hearing about Cambridge because my father got a Marshall Scholarship to come to Pembroke. So I heard about it my whole life, the best two years of his entire life. Um, but so it's thrilling to be here. And I hope you all will forgive me if I stumble a little bit. I got on the plane at 10 p.m. last night, and I haven't really slept since. But I think if I'm not coherent, you all can call me on it. Um, so I want to talk to you about why I got into the work that I'm doing. I'll tell you a little bit um, about, um, about what I do and why I do it. And then, as we discussed, we'll, we'll talk about the election at the end, because it's the only thing anybody is talking about um, in America right now. And um, we had a, a Skype the other day with women from Liberia, and they all told me during the whole call that it is affecting the world, the, the loss of Hillary Clinton. So. Um, and I'm going to look at notes so I don't get too far off track, but um, I'd love to keep it informal. And if there's something you'd like for me to explain more, please just raise your hand, and I'd be happy to, to clarify. Um, so first of all, I was um, very lucky, and I, I don't know how many of you women in this room would feel the same way, that I made it pretty far in life without ever really feeling that my track to leadership would be different because I was a woman. So I actually, I had these great political jobs. I grew up in Washington, DC. I worked in the Senate, then I worked in the early Clinton White House. And then, um, and then it wasn't until I was almost 30 that I went to work for a law firm that all of a sudden a light bulb went off and I saw that it's actually, my path was going to be different. I was going to face more barriers because I was a woman. Um, so let me tell you two things that happened then. One was that I, my job was as a lobbyist. I would go to, um, to the um, Congress, and I would go to the executive branch, and my job was to lobby people, convince them to, to vote or act the way that my clients wanted. And the young associates and I would sit around at lunch after we'd gone to these meetings, and we'd say, have you noticed that the people we're talking to, they're almost all men, and they are um, generally much, much older than we are. And so we would talk about, you know, who are our role models? And in my other jobs, I'd had these fabulous women at the top who were great role models for me. But all of a sudden, in the law firm, there really weren't any role models. And there was one woman who was a partner, and she actually told me, um, in my early 30s, I was um, starting to think about having children. She's like, listen, you can absolutely you know, become a partner in a law firm and have children. You can make it work. I had a great system. I would carve out a half an hour every day to make sure I saw my children. And I thought, oh, well, that doesn't sound like you know, she's not going to be my role model. That was not what I was looking for. Um, but so at the same time that all of this was happening, um, I'd been thrown into this much more male-dominated world. There was one woman at the firm, um, she was a consultant at the firm, and she was uh, Governor Ann Richards from Texas, and she had been one of the most dynamic um, supporters of, of women's rights in, in, in America, and just this larger-than-life personality, and she was the first person that really talked to me about what was being done um, to empower women and to break down some of the barriers that were holding women back. And around this time, a colleague came to me, and she said, listen, I think what we need to do, we are serious about this, and we want to create a better world for people like us, you know, that what we need to do is we need to form a political action committee that is gonna give money to young women like us who are running for office so that we can get them in early, and then we'll have these wonderful women who believe, you know, who are going through the same stuff in life that we're going through. And so we, didn't know at all what we were doing, but we decided to form this um, political action committee called WOOFPAC, Women Under 40 Political Action Committee. And um, we were bipartisan. Nothing in the states is bipartisan. You're on this side or you're on this side, but we decided we would mix everybody up there together. And it actually was a huge success. We got a lot of um, young women who just, they'd already decided to run for office, but we were the first people who came to them and said, we believe in you, we're happy that you're running, we're gonna give you some money. It was never very much money, but we would give them a little bit of money. And many of those people who we supported, they did go on to um, become real leaders in the House and the Senate. So it worked. So, but the thing that didn't work 
is that what we wanted was more women in Congress, more women in political leadership. And yet, every year, if we were really, really good at our job, if we supported these women as much as we possibly could, maybe we'd get five elected. And so the numbers were just so small. And this was not because we had this really stringent test and said, you know, you have to be just like the most brilliant, perfect woman leader ever. We basically would take you if you had a website and were running for office and were under 40 and a woman. Like that was it. It was a very, very low bar. But the problem was that there were not enough women running for office. And so one day, I'd been running this group for five years. One day, I, I went out on a walk actually, and started thinking, I'd read so much research about why women don't run, and I thought, I, I need to do something different. And so that was when I started it, the nonprofit that I now run called Running Start um, to come up with a more creative solution to the problem of getting more women into politics. So I want to back up for a second and just say, um, this whole question of why women don't run, when I talk to women around the world and say, you know, why do you think there are not as many women in leadership? They say, um, people don't vote for women. You know, there's discrimination. There are all these external factors that they see as the barrier to not having enough women in leadership. But actually, when you look at the research, when you dig down and really talk to the people about what they would think about running, I kept coming up with the same, I kept hearing the same answers. And that it wasn't so much in America, the external barriers saying, we're not going to have women in this position, or we would never vote for a woman here. It was much more the internal barriers. And so there's this great research that took um, like a thousand professional women and men in, in the States. And they were all at the top of their careers in academia and law. Um, and in and, and business, and they asked them, would you run for office? And they said, if you'd run for office, what position would you run for? And if you would not run for office, then um, why not? So you guys could probably tell me what the answers to this were. So um, of course, two thirds more men said that they would run for office than women. And then when they um, asked women, well, when they asked the men, so what would you like to, to run for if you ran for office? Some of the men put down president, you know? I mean, they, why not just go, go all the way? And the women would put down offices that were much, much lower. Like they might, some of the low offices in the states are like school board um, or um, county commissioner, smaller things. And then the most interesting part of this whole study that really is the crux of my work and the reason that I started Running Start was, so then they asked the women, so if you don't want to run for office, what's holding you back? And do you all, can we make this a little bit interactive? Can anybody, what do you think is holding women back? Like, what are some of the big factors you all would think they would have said on this, this survey? Yeah? Family. Family, right? Trying to balance work and family because women tend to be the caretakers much more. Um, what else? Yeah? I'm not sure I'm good enough. I'm not sure I'm good enough. Okay, well, that's the really big one. Any, any other ones? Yeah? Slightly aggressive environment. Oh, yeah, right, not wanting to be a part of something that's, that's so aggressive. Yeah, others? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, and, and there are others, like sexism in politics, uh, which gets a little bit to the aggressive environment, but women thinking, I would never want to expose myself to that, or, or I have skeletons in my closet, and I don't want people to see those skeletons. Um, or the fact that women worry about fundraising and they say, well, I could never fundraise. But I can't remember who said it. You did. But so the number one factor that, that trumped all of those was women feeling not qualified. And that's how the question was worded. Um, you know, they were allowed to check, I don't feel qualified to run for office. And so I have thought about this so much. And if you talked to me a year ago, I would have given you a different spin on this. And I want to try this out on you all, because this is my new thinking about what that means. Because I look out at you all. You're at this elite college. I know you're going to go on to do big things, interesting things with your life. The idea that you all would say, I don't feel good enough to do this job, it's a little insulting. I mean, it does feel that way to me, for me to stand up here and say, women don't feel they're good enough to do this job. 
So here's my new thinking. My new thinking is that if somebody in the audience said to me, Susanna, you should really think about electrical engineering as a career. I think you'd be fantastic at it. I think you know, it is the place for you. We need more women in that field. That I would literally take a step back and think, oh wait, I don't know anything about electrical engineering. I don't even know an electrical engineer. I don't, even, I don't, I don't know a single woman who's doing that job. It doesn't seem like it's my place. Somebody over here said, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's your place. And I think that is more what the women were saying. I think it's more that they felt like this is not a place that I can imagine. I, I just don't even understand what the path would be to get to, to this place. Um, so that study made me think, all right, well, so if somebody who's my age feels that they are, um, it's not their place, they can't imagine it. So what if you went back to my 14-year-old self, who was totally awkward, but anyway, what if you went back to my 14-year-old self and said, um, there's this career, we really need women in it. If we get more women in it, it's not just gonna be good for women, it is going to be good for society as a whole. It's gonna be good for men, boys, girls, everybody, because it's gonna give us diversity of leadership, we're gonna make better decisions, we're gonna look at problems different ways, you need to get in it. So if you talked to my 14-year-old self and said that, and then showed me what the path was, maybe I'd really consider it. And so that is the crux of the work that I do right now. Um, we've been around for 10 years, and we train, as I said, girls as young as 14 and as old as 25. And what we're trying to do with them is we introduce them to role models and to people in power so that those people can actually help them on their path to leadership in practical, concrete ways. We teach them real skills that they would need to use if they want to be a leader in, frankly, in anything, but certainly in politics, such as public speaking. You have to be able to, to speak in public if you're going to try and get your message across. Um, writing a message that's concise and will win people over. Uh, media training is one of the big things we do. Fundraising, because women repeatedly tell me all the time I cannot fundraise. Like, it's a, it's a definite, it's not something that I'm able to do. And um, they do these, these things. They've never done most of these things ever before. At the end of the week-long period that we have them, so the high school girls we have for a week, the college women we have for different periods of time, but at the end of the week, they can do them. Now, maybe they're not great at them, but they know that they're not going to die by standing up on stage, which sounds silly, but some of them just think, there's no way I'm going to do this thing. You wonder why they signed up for the program. But anyway, um, so, but at the end of the week, they know that these skills are skills that can be taught. They are skills that, can, that they can learn. That it's like learning golf or tennis. That you can become, if you're an introvert, you can learn how to project yourself and your personality. Um, if you are terrible at public speaking, you can learn to do it in a way that's authentic and real. And I think there's such power in them realizing that the people who they see on TV who are political leaders you know, at the top of the, the countries, they were not born with these skills. They had to practice them. It's a rare person who, who just comes out of the womb ready to, ready to go on these things. Um, and to me, I like the people who struggle a tiny bit. You know, the perfectly polished speaker, maybe not quite as interesting to listen to as somebody who you know is really real and is saying something that, that is coming from their heart and maybe they are a little bit nervous, so which is what we tell them. And then the last thing that we do with these students, which I think is probably the most important thing, is we talk to them about what we were just talking about earlier, about the fact that for some reason, women, much, much more than men, feel that they're not right for this job. And they feel, frankly, sometimes like they're not a good fit for being a leader, for whatever reason it is. And we talk to them about how when this happens to you, understand it's a phenomena and call it out and push past it, which is way easier said than done. But, but the idea is that all of us feel like an imposter sometimes. And that what we 
have to do, if we're ever going to get anywhere, is we have to see, see that for what it is, that it's, that it's something that we feel and that it's not based on fact, and we need to push forward. And I've thought a lot about the fact that you know, for the entire history of the world, men have been the leaders. There have been some outliers, right? But I mean, but mostly, the entire history of the world, the people who we've looked up to as leaders, they are all men. So women, we are still trying to figure out who we are as leaders. We're still trying to figure out like what, what a woman leader looks like. Um, in the States with, with Hillary Clinton, you know, we would talk about how she was a very tough woman. You know, she was very frank, no nonsense. Um, she got a lot of, of bad press for that, like she was too tough and too aggressive. But I guarantee you that if she had been softer, I mean, the last campaign she cried, and that was a huge problem too. So we're still trying to figure out, not just as women, but as society as a whole, um, how, how we lead and what we, we need to, to look like as leaders. So I want to tell you just a couple, oh, you know what, I just totally skipped something. This is why I had the notes here and then I did not look at the notes. Um, so that's my jet lagged brain. Um, I want to tell you some stories about um, three of my students. But first, just because maybe you all don't know this, um, how well do you all think America is doing in terms of um, getting women into politics? Better or worse than the UK? Okay, well, you guys are very sophisticated. Yes, we're not doing much worse because you all are not doing fabulously, but <laughs> you have had some women who are at the top and we still have not gotten there. And um, our Congress, um, we have, we're now at 19% or just above 19%. Um, and I think you all are at 23% around then. Um, our state legislatures have been stuck at around 23, 24 for years. The number's just not going up. Um, we have, of the 100 largest cities in the US, there are only 13 women mayors. And some of them are just great. I love the women mayors, but, um, but there are only 13. This cycle, so we, I think the most women governors we've ever had, it's either six or nine. Um, so here's what happened this year. This year, which was supposed to be the year of the woman. So now we have, we lost a governor, so we have only five women governors out of 50. And the number of women in Congress didn't change. So, you know, some people dropped out of the Senate and some people were added, you know, but, but basically we had 104 last Congress and we've got 104 now. Um, these numbers are similar to the UK. Um, they are um, significantly worse than so many other countries in the world. And here's your interactive time again. So why, what is the one thing that many other countries have that gives them more women in legislatures? Quotas. Yeah, so they have quotas. So our countries are most likely not going to have quotas. Um, and so we, we have to be creative about how we, um, how we get there without quotas. Um, and so the numbers are true, not just to politics, but if you look at women's leadership across all sectors, we're stuck at about 20. So there are, oh, I actually wrote this down because I wanted to be right about it. So um, only 4% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, I feel like it's not 4%. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it's 4% of Fortune 500 companies are women in the States. Um, and it's about 20% in corporate leadership. More women graduate from um, business school and law school in the States than men, and yet, I told you, business is stuck at 20. And law firm partners, there's still only a, um, a quarter of law firm partners are women. And so one of our programs works with student government leaders um, in colleges around the country, <coughs> and it's true of student governments. So there might be more women than men in a student government, I mean, in a college. Sorry, one second. <coughs> I think I got a cold on the way over. Um, so more women than men at a college, but more men on the student government. Oh, excuse me. Anybody want to ask a question while I... Why don't you do that? No, 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 I can do it. I'll just have a... <coughs> Sorry, and the mic is right here where I'm coughing, so. <laughs> <laughs> we like 
my bad thoughts. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so we're basically, we're not doing a good job anywhere. And it's, it's a little bit better, as we said, in some countries, but overall, the world is lacking in female leadership. <clears throat> and so, um, the work that we do at Running Start, my hope is that we are going to build an army of young women. They're going to know that they can run. They're going to know the path there. And they are going to, moreover, they're going to understand how important it is for them to get into leadership because it's going to help society as a whole. So I'm going to tell you three little stories about students. Um, so the first one has to do with not looking the part. We had a student um, last year who came, and her name was Rana, and she wore a headscarf. And the first day she told me, she's a Muslim student, she said, um, you know, my dream is to run for Congress, but of course I can't do that, so I'd love to talk to you about what I could do. I was like, well, why not? Why can't you run for Congress? She said, there's nobody in, in the U.S. Congress with a headscarf. There are no Muslim people. There is one Muslim person in the U.S. Congress right now out of 535, um, and it's a man. But so we talked, I talked to her about it. She said, you know, I've always wanted to run for student government in my high school, um, but there's no way I could do it. I look too different. There's nobody like me who does it. So we, we all talked to her that week about how somebody has to do it. You have to have it first, right? Because then nobody will ever do it. So this student, she's awesome in many ways, um, she went to, to Middlebury College in the States. And freshman year, she ran for student government. She's the only woman on the ballot. And she's the only Muslim. And, and one of the only you know, people there wearing headscarves. And so she won. And I, I love that idea that sometimes you just need to be told. You need somebody from the outside to say, it's OK. You can do this um, in order to actually make it happen. So story number two is a student um, from a couple years ago named Maya. We, um, as I said, we make them stand up on stage, bright lights, microphones, very intimidating. And this woman stood up and she gave a little, they give elevator speeches, so these short little speeches. And she gave um, a fine speech. It wasn't great, but it was okay. And she got fine feedback from the audience. The audience is always very um, supportive. So after she spoke, a student came and said, Susanna, you need to go check on Maya in the hallway. So I, I went out into the hall, and Maya was sitting down, and her face was totally pale, and she was shaking. And she had tears just streaming down her cheeks. I'm like, Maya, what's, what's wrong? She said, I think I'm having a panic attack. She said, I just, that was the most stressful thing I've ever done, and I, I, I'm never, ever going to do that again. Like, that was just a disaster. I'm like, well, you know, you were good. You were, you were totally fine. And, but she had this very extreme reaction. So the next day, usually we do these speaking things in small groups. So the next day was our big summit, where we invite 300 people. It's a room like, you know, four times the size. And only four of the students were chosen to come up and actually present again in front of that whole group. So I looked at the list first thing in the morning, and Maya's name was on the list. And so the first thing that I did when I got into the auditorium was I went up to her and I said, listen, you don't have to do this. You, you get a pass. Like, I never give anybody a pass, but it was scary watching the panic attack last night. And you get a pass, you, you don't have to speak. And she looked at me and she said, no, I'm going to do it. She said, um, one of the, the, um, the counselors told me, if I don't do this today, it's going to get harder and harder every day, you know, it, for the rest of my life. And it, it will become this thing that, you know, that, that's going to really be a problem for me. And she said, I'll do it. And the crazy thing is she stood up in front of, so this was, of course, not just her peers, but strangers. And her speech was so much better than it was the day before. It was this just beautiful, impassioned speech about how she wants to be the first, um, or she wants to be president of Argentina, where she's from. So... To me, when I see things like that, it lets me know this idea works and that it's not rocket science trying to convince young women to run for office. 
it's very straightforward, but nobody else is doing it in the States. I mean, we, we train women to be leaders, like Girl Scouts, wonderful group, and they, they talk to women about you know, being, um, being a leader and being the best you can be, but politics is a dirty word. So you don't talk about politics. And so Running Start is very avant-garde in the fact that we do talk about politics and we, we want them to be leaders and maybe they won't get into politics, maybe they'll lead in, in business or they'll start a nonprofit or they'll become advocates in some way. But we tell them, we want you to know you can run and that you can do real good if you can do it. And so my last story is about this woman named Allison Carpenter we do this training um, in colleges around the country on how to run for student government. And so this woman, this young woman, Allison, she was, she must have been 18, it was her freshman year, and she sat through the training and she wrote us a little note later saying that as she um, left the training, she was so inspired and just absolutely you know, fired up and, and was gonna, going to run. And she said, you know, I think I'm actually going to try and run for local office as opposed to just for student government. And so she found that um, in Washington, D.C., where, um, where she's from, the lowest office is this thing called Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner. And so she, she figured out how to do it with help from people she met at the program. She ran for it, and she became the youngest ever um, ANC commissioner in D.C. And she's a woman of color. Like the whole story was just so beautiful. She walks out of the program, and then three months later, she's actually elected. And the great follow-up about Allison is she did that position for a while. She actually came to Oxford to study for a year. And while she was at Oxford, she realized that her student elections for um, college um, class president were going on back at her university, which was Howard University. And she heard from her friends that only men were on the, on the ballot. And she did not like that. Um, so she flew back from Oxford, and she put a little campaign team together. And she basically, she decided we can't have a, a race at this college and not include um, some women, and, she, and I'm qualified and I could do it. And so she ran for office and she won, and she's now the, um, the class president of Howard University. And once she won, she um, immediately, people tried to impeach her because it was so outrageous that this woman would have stepped in and um, come in last minute and run a campaign and won. But she won in her own right, and she was able to, um, to carry on. And, so those are a few stories about what we do. Uh, of the 10,000 women that have gone through the program, we're in touch with so many of them. They see us as a family. And we are not um, a typical family. We are incredibly, incredibly diverse. I told you before with the PAC that nobody mixes the two parties in the US because they hate each other so much. So, um, running start, also, we are Democrats, Independents, and Republicans. And we room these girls together for a week. They are chosen, or they're paired with a roommate who frequently, just because of the demographics of the program, is very, very different than, than who they are. And they'll sometimes come up to me the first day and say, I cannot, I'm not going to room with her. You know, she is a, a far right Republican, and our, we could not be more different. And sometimes one of them comes from a really wealthy family and one of them comes from a family from poverty. Um, they're different races, they're different religions. So that is the unintended um, benefit of our program is that these women are being thrown together in combinations that they've never been thrown together in um, back in their, in their ordinary life. And that's actually the main thing that I want. I want these women to know that they can run, but I don't want just anybody to get into office. I want them to be really good. I want them to be different. I want them to be the type of people who are going to find common ground with people who are not like themselves and who are going to be really good, strong leaders. And so what I've seen so far from them is that they will be. So I could talk about this stuff forever. I'm gonna close and just tell you um, Actually, do I have time to do one more thing? Okay. Um, maybe during questions we can talk about the election. I'll tell you a little story, but I'd love to have questions about that. Um, so the Pope, I'm not Catholic, but um, this <laughs> really moved me. The Pope came to Washington um, a couple years ago, and he spoke to Congress. 
And there is a quote from what he said, which is what politics really means to me. He said, politics is an expression of our compelling need to live as one in order to build as one the greatest common good, that of a community which sacrifices particular interest in order to have in justice and peace its goods, its interest, its social life. And nobody thinks politics is that these days, right? Politics is so ugly and it's just, it's not that, but that is what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be problem solving. It's supposed to be looking at society and figuring out how you can change things for the better. And when you get diverse voices in, when you get people in who have not been in power before, and that's you all in this room, you do see change. And you do get to reform systems and make them better than what they are right now. So that's my great hope for the future. And my note about the election is, um, even though my whole office bawled, like actually bawled, like they, you know, mascara running down their cheeks, kind of crying, um, after, after Hillary lost, we have gotten so many emails and phone calls from young women telling us that they want to run. And it's just, it, it's been spontaneous. We didn't ask them to. So I think, my prediction is that, you know, it's 2016 right now, that in the next congressional election for the U.S., I think we're going to see a sweep of women coming into office. Um, back in 1992, there was a, um, there was a, we were electing a Supreme Court justice, and um, it was really, really contentious because there were allegations that he was um, sexist. And after that happened, we got an enormous upswing of women in Congress. I think it's going to happen again. So that's my little bright note um, for anybody who is interested in the American election. I think that possibly the outcome, the ultimate outcome, will be good. So thank you all so much. Thank you.